Hello. Um, so about, it's actually, wow, going on three years ago, I was at um, South by Southwest. It's a festival in um, Austin, Texas. Um, and there's a tech portion to it. Uh, so I was there to sort of do my disability spiel. And um, what happened was, is before I went to give my talk, I had spent the months leading up to it asking the, the people, the, the powers that be at South By to make sure that there was an interpreter for my talk because I had a couple of deaf friends who were gonna be there and I wanted to make sure that they had access to what I was gonna say. Um, and I was so pissed when I got there because when I arrived, the inter there was no interpreters in sight, there was no captioning. Um, but it ended up being okay because they didn't speak until the next day. But the next day I ended up going to their session and there were two deaf people and two non-deaf people on the panel. And I don't know if you know much about deaf culture, but when deaf people speak, deaf people show up. And so there was this sort of parade of, of deaf people that I saw walking into the room. And the frustrating thing was, is that the only interpreter that was in the room was the one that Jenny Leigh Fleury, the chief accessibility officer of Microsoft, had flown in with her from Seattle. And so what you had was, is you had a room full of deaf people who were trying to read an interpreter from behind her back. So when it was time for the question and answer session, so, uh, the very first person that takes the mic and the first question they ask is, is where are the interpreters, right? So that's how it went. While I was at that panel, a friend of mine said, oh, there's a really interesting panel on phantom pain that we should go to. It's right after this, do you wanna come with me? And I said, sure. And so I go and when I arrive, I'm shocked because the panel is called end of disability. And I think to myself, you wouldn't have an end of women panel. You wouldn't have an end of gay people panel. Why are you having an end of disability panel? And when it was time for the Q&A session, I got up and I said as much. And my friend who was there happened to record me and the video made the rounds on disability Twitter and it prompted Hugh Forrest, who's the head of South by Southwest, to reach out. He said he wanted to talk. So we get on this call and um, we're basically taking turns creatively telling each other how much we hate each other, right? It's like one of those kind of talks. And at one point, I finally tell him, I say, I'm gonna create a technology that's gonna shed light on your access failures. And he says to me, fine, do it. And I say, fine, I'm gonna do it. And then we hang up and I'm like, shit. Like, I have no idea how to do this. So uh, the, the day that I took the call with Hugh, I had actually just started a fellowship at this organization called SY Partners. Uh, my mentor, a woman named Reed Norgard, had invited me to come in and just work out of this space and get a feel for it. I knew her because she had designed my purple cane and she was a managing director there. So I hang up the call with Hugh and I go and I'm pacing around the kitchen, right? This is my first, maybe second day and this guy walks up to me and he says, what are you doing here? And I say, what are you talking about? And he says, what are you doing here? And I was like, I don't, like, I don't know. He's like, you weren't at South By, were you? And I said, yes, yeah, I was. He's like, you weren't at an end of disability panel, were you? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh my God, that night, he said, I was so blown away by you that I went home and the only thing I told my wife was the thing that you said. He said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, my, 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 my mentor, Ree, said I should come in and, um, and, and just work out of the space. I said, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm the head of product. I'm like, well, that's great, because I just got off the call with Hugh Forrest and I told him I was gonna make this thing. And he's like, well, what is it? And I said, well, basically it's a live speech to text app. The app is called Thyssen. You can actually, if you want right now, you can download it on your phones and you can actually watch me speaking in real time. Um, and what it does is it creates access for people when there may not traditionally be access. Uh, he said, oh, okay, that sounds easy. I'm gonna make you a demo. So he makes me a demo, right? And it works. And we're both a little bit freaked out. I didn't know what to do. And so randomly, Google Creative Lab calls me and they say, um, we want you to come speak before this hackathon. And I say, great, pay me. And they're like, okay. So they're paying me $5,000. And I'm like, well, what do I talk about? And I was like, I'm gonna pitch them, right? So they basically paid me $5,000 to pitch them. <laughs> so I go in and I use my, my, I shoot my shot, right? And I pitch them and they're like, this is great. They built the back end, they gave me a $50,000 grant. And we ended up launching it two years later at South by Southwest. So we launched it during the accessibility sessions. We do uh, sometimes dozens of conferences a day. We're doing all sorts of interesting stuff. 
Interestingly, in that time, three or four other speech-to-text apps have cropped up in the field. And the thing that I find so frustrating is that we are the only app that is not marketing itself as a productivity app, right? And this is how it happens in disability. You go and you create a solution that may actually benefit disabled people, and what you do is, is you market it in a way that ultimately recreates that disability. So how do I better explain this? You have to look at history. So disability didn't actually exist before industrialization, right? You would have me with my cane, you would have a deaf person, you'd have a blind person, right? And we'd be existing in our communities. It wasn't great, but we were contributing as we could. But we were never associated with each other, right? There was, we were never grouped together. There was never this thing called disability. And what happened was is industrialization rolled around and it created these expectations of norm and mass because it expected bodies to operate in these mechanized ways, right? And so suddenly, for the first time in history, there was a subset of bodies that couldn't contribute. And these industry at the time turned to doctors and philosophers, and these bodies were then diagnosed and segregated and institutionalized. And this is the creation of disability, right? It quite simply means unable to contribute. We live in a post-industrialized era. Disability is an emerging $8 trillion market. It is larger than the size of China. And on average, about any college population is about 11% disabled. And yet, we have these mantras of productivity that recreate disability. And so for me, the question is, is how do you address that, right? And for me, the thing that I do is I like to start thinking critically and creatively about disability. So. Um, Oh, there's my, so I'm actually like, I don't do things. Like I don't, I, I've never made a thing, but like I can prod people. Um, so back, I don't know, maybe like eight months ago, there was this tweet, it said, it's by Lego. It says, we're super excited to introduce Lego Braille Bricks. It's a new product from the Lego Foundation that will help blind and visually impaired children learn Braille in a playful and inclusive way. So below this uh, tweet was a video and I'm gonna play that video for you right now. So as you're watching this ad, I want you to ask yourself, how does this make me feel? Are you feeling inspired? Is your faith restored in humanity? Do I have any blind friends in the audience? This process is so lonely sometimes. If I had a blind friend in the audience, they might tell you that this video pisses them off. And then? Why? How would they know what's in it? Right? This video it may have been about them, but it definitely wasn't for them, right? And this is how it happens in disability. The things that are sort of considered being for us, right, or about us, are never actually for us. So let's look at another example. I don't know if any of you saw this ad by Nike, but this, in this ad, what they do is they sign their first ever disabled athlete. Um, they launched this ad on World Cerebral Palsy Day because Justin Galagos has cerebral palsy, but it's not even four seconds into this ad, and Nike is telling us that Justin suffers from cerebral palsy, right? Does this look like somebody who is suffering to you, right? Anyway, as the ad progresses, we learn that Nike is surprising Justin with a professional contract. They're surprising him, but if you Google signing day, what you see is image after image of athletes sitting at a table, contract, pen in hand. Sure, sometimes there may be balloons. This is worth celebrating, but they are treated as professionals because that is what this is. This is a professional contract, right? And this is what's so interesting is, is because Nike doesn't realize that what they are telling us is that they don't see Justin as a valuable signee, right? The simple act of turning a professional contract into a gift tells us that they think it's their charitable gesture that creates value. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's a terrible message to send to disabled people. But then again, if you really watch the ad, you'll find out that we weren't the intended audience. Everybody else was, right? Nike was simply using us to inspire you. And this is why it's important for designers to be aware of how brands depict their interactions 
with us, right? Because what happens is, is a designer gets a design brief on disability, and the first thing that they do is they Google design and disability, and it's not the things that we believe that comes up, it is the brand depictions. So I created a resource to address this. I call it Critical Access. It's just criticalaccess.org. And if you look at the logo, you'll see that the upper right-hand quadrant is filled in. And that's because critical access is a matrix, right? On the top, you have amplifying. On the bottom, you have stigma. On the left, you have traditional. And on the right, you have emerging. And what is, exists in the matrix are tropes that are rooted in disability studies, right? And if you look at the upper right-hand quadrant, these are more aspirational, amplifying, emerging trends that we want brands to aspire to. Um, and so what we have done is we've created a repository of disability representation in media. So anytime there's an ad that features a disabled person, we upload it onto critical access, we review it from a disability studies framework, we tag it according to the tropes. And like, I'm smart, but like, I'm also dumb. And so like, I didn't realize when I started doing this that I was actually creating a data set. And when somebody pointed it out to me, I started to get creative. And one of the first things I did was is I went through every single ad and I counted the amount of words that disabled people spoke. And then I went onto YouTube and I cataloged and I categorized the comments. And one of the first things that I learned from critical access is that the more words a disabled person speaks, the less believable the ad is perceived to be. So if you were to kind of click through on any of these tropes, you'd arrive at a page uh, that describes what the trope is and then below, it would show all of the videos that exist within those tropes. Um, and I, it, we have yet to actually find an ad that features a disabled person of color, right? So there is so much, we, there's all these holes that we're learning about through critical access. Another big one is, is a lot of brands like to claim to be the first, and what that ultimately serves to do is, is erase disabled people, right? So what you're looking at here is, is actually the Lego Braille bricks that, that was in that ad before, right? But this, this is tactiles, right? And tactiles have been around since the 1980s, and they're a product of a blind family. And so what happened was, is when Lego announced Braille bricks, they actually didn't create a consumer product. Right? They created a product that they were going to donate to various blind organizations for free. Tactiles has not been able to secure funding, again, because disability doesn't get funded, we only get fixed. And because Tactiles was unable to secure funding, they were forced to charge about $700 for this set. And again, this is um, a beloved company within the, the blind community. But when LIGO announced Braille Bricks, one in unintended outcome was is they put Tactiles out of business, right? And this is how it happens, right? The things that we radically fight for never cease to turn into things that are empathetically done for us, right? This is disability. So a couple of years ago, I created the WIF Fellowship because what I did was is I went and I Googled the phrase design for disability. And what I discovered was is that it yields more than twice as many search results as disability design. That number is up to about 10 times as many search results as disability design, right? This idea that we are recipients of design has embedded itself into our language. But if you look throughout history, it's disabled people that create the innovations to ch that change the world. We invented the bicycle. We invented cruise control. We invented the internet, email, curb cuts, the electric toothbrush. The list goes on and on, and yet we are perceived as recipients of design. And so I created the WIT Fellowship, as in design with disability. And one of the first things that happened was is brands started approaching me, and they, they would say to me, oh, so you're talking about co-design. And the thing I would say to them is, is no, I'm not talking about co-design at all. With is the antithesis of co-design. So what's the difference? Well, in co-design, it's, the, it's the, the organizations and the powers that be that get to decide when and how a disabled person is included. But with is disabled people inserting ourselves into the process. So early on with the WIF Fellowship, I made a rule for myself where I wouldn't tell stories of the WIF Fellows to validate our own successes, right? That was not something that I wanted to allow to happen. Um, and so now I'm gonna tell a story about one of the WIF fellows. Um, so what happened was, is one of the WIF fellows was invited to speak on a podcast. And after she would finished her interview, she said, oh, well, you should speak to Liz Jackson. And um, so the podcast reached out and we did an interview and I thought to myself, um, because she had also spoken, that it would be safe for me to tell this really good story that I'm not gonna tell you about her. And so I told the story, but what happened after I told that story was, is they went back and they interviewed her again. 
And when the podcast came out, I was horrified because they had shifted the way the story was told and they used her as an example of my good deed, right? This is rigorous work that we have to do in this space to make sure that we are not objectifying our disabled counterparts, right? And so it's really important like, to kind of analyze these dynamics of how things that we, we radically fight for become things that are empathetically done for us and to really push back. Because interestingly, even though it's not perfect, but I won't get into that right now, Lego changed, right? So uh, this was a few months later. They said everybody should be able to enjoy Lego Play, which is why we're excited to launch Lego Audio and Braille Instructions. And then... Um, these blind children are building using Lego Audio and Braille Instructions. Mount the helicopter center on top of the landing skids. A free service that gives visually impaired people a new way to build. Enjoy. The instructions were inspired by Matthew Schifrin, a blind Lego fan. So they changed, right? Not only did they provide audio um, descriptions of what is on the screen, but they also credited Matthew Schifrin for the idea that he brought to them and that he you know, ended up making with them. Um, and so <laughs> where this leaves me is, is um, I wish IDEO would pay attention. So I am so sick of this story, but somebody from IDEO uh, approached me recently and said that everybody underneath the powers that be at IDEO love me, and so now I'm telling the story with even more gusto because I'm like, okay. So IDEO is this sort of do-good you know, company in, in, that's based everywhere. Um, so <laughs> awkwardly, awkwardly, their offices are conjoined with SY Partners, which makes it really awkward, um, but I'm good at awkward. So anyway, uh, so a couple of years ago, IDEO invited me to come into their offices. They said, we want to show you something. And I'm like, OK. So I go into their office, and they say, we created a technology that's intended to get disabled people hired. And I was like, great. What disabled people did you hire to create this technology that's intended to get disabled people hired? And they were like, none. And then they sort of showed me the door. Um, and I was like, this. Like, I just could not get over it. Um, and so um, I went home, and I just started thinking, like, how, is it, how does this happen, right? Like, how do good intentions go awry? And the first thing I really honed in on was a, a critique of design thinking, right? So what is design thinking? As you guys probably know, it's, it's, it's an approach to design that really gained steam in the 1960s. It was created, in essence, by white men who have no equals, right? These are um, men who are at the top of their professions, aligned with many of the greatest institutions in the world, and they were creating products that filled the homes of millions of people all over the world. And what they started realizing was is that design wasn't reaching everyone. And so they created a system built on empathy to fill in those gaps. And while I argue that much good has come from design thinking, it has inadvertently fueled the narrative that we are recipients rather than drivers of design. So what I propose instead is something I call design questioning, which looks at design thinking from the user's perspective. Because what I believe is, is when we're finally able to question the systems that disable us, everyone involved stops seeing our bodies as the problem, right? So let's look at design thinking from the user's perspective. Um, so step one of design thinking is, is cultivating empathy through observations and interviews. But to a disabled person, this can feel a little bit more, a little bit less like cultivating empathy and a little bit more like designers are gleaning our ideas and our life hacks, and then they're selling them back to us as inspirational do-good without ever giving us the credit. It reminds me of the story of OXO kitchen products. So are you guys familiar with OXO? There are these products with these gummy sort of tactile handles. Um, and if you, up until recently, thanks to me, if you went on the OXO website, what you would read is the story of Sam Farber and how he decided to make a better peeler for his wife Betsy to use because of her arthritis. Um, I actually, uh, I sit across from the office from uh, the desk from Tucker Veermeister, a mentor of mine. I re lovingly refer to him as the world's most industrial designer. And Tucker invented the grip, the good grips. 
And so this one day, I happened to ask Tucker. I said, Tucker, can you tell me about Betsy? I've never heard much about her. And he said, oh, yeah. Um, did you know that Betsy was a designer? I said, no. I'm like, I did not know she was a designer. And he said, yeah, she was around all the time. And I was thinking about it and sort of, I, I was like, I could not come up with a designer who I can, could imagine would just in, allow her husband to inspirationally make her a better peeler. And so this one day, I just pick up the phone and I call Betsy, and the first thing that she says to me is, is I'm going to go down in history as being Sam's lowly crippled wife when it was actually my idea in the first place. So that's step one. So step two of design questioning or design thinking is defining the problem, right? So you have our insights glean, and now we're going to define the problem. But because disabled people are rarely invited uh, to participate in this process, let alone lead it, it oftentimes becomes us that's defined as the, prob as the problem rather than the problem being defined as the problem. So you have our insights gleaned, we are defined as the problem, and then designers enter this iterative process of ideation, prototyping, and testing, which leads to what I call the unacknowledged sixth step of design thinking, or as I call it, design thinking, because we are expected to be grateful for that which has been done for us. Right? So I got through design thinking, and I was just like, something's missing, something's missing, and then, aha. I realize we have lost the plot. Like this is actually like it's called empathy wines, but like it's out of my price range. And you ask the guy, he's like, I have empathy for the buyer, the seller. I'm like, but not for me. Anyway, so I started really questioning empathy. And one of the things that I learned about it was is that the word empathy, it's only been around for maybe like 111 years, right? The word was coined in the United States in 1909. And it derived from a German term called Einfühlung. So what happened was, is there was this psychologist. His name was Theodore Lips. And he was friends with Rilke and Rodin. He was Freud's mentor, right? And what he realized was, is when a person goes into a museum and they encounter a great work of art, right? They might tug at their collar, or they might put their hand on their chest, or they might sway. And the thing that he discovered was, is that people are physically moved by works of great human expression. And so he created a term. That term was Einfühlung, and that is what it meant. It meant physically moved by works of great human expression. And it took off in Germany, and it ultimately made its way to the United States in the form of empathy. But it wasn't just the word that changed, right? When it shifted to empathy, it no longer meant physically moved by works of great human expression. And what it came to mean was feeling sympathy or in the case of disability, as we experience it, feeling pity for a person's situation or circumstance, right? And this is the thing that really kind of gets me going, because if you think about it, at the same time as empathy was shifting from inspiration to pity, the same time disability, our perceptions of it, were shifting from pity to inspiration. And I think in this process, I feel like we have lost the capacity to really glean or decipher one emotion from the other. And for me, this has led to three outcomes, right? So what are those three outcomes? The first is, is that empathy reifies class and power structures, right? So you always have the empathizer, and you always have the, what I call the empathizee, right? And it's always the empathizer that gets to tell the story, right? The second thing is, is I think it prescribes emotion, I, emotions. The, the best way that I've been able to kind of describe this, and I need to get better at it, but I, I feel like we are trying so hard to, like, to, to make, make things feel a certain way that we've forgotten to make things do a certain thing. Like We think that feeling is doing, and it's not. And the last thing is, is it silences the recipient, right? And so when I reflect on my own experiences the last few years, right, the thing I realize is, is that questioning systems has done a whole hell of a lot more for me than empathy ever could have. So I was at an event called 99U. Uh, we were using Thyssen to transcribe when Tim Brown, so Tim Brown was the CEO of IDEO. He'd spent the last 30 years of his career popularizing design thinking. So I'm transcribing him, and I'm thinking to myself, dude isn't saying design thinking. What the hell? Fortunately, there was an interviewer. And that interviewer decided to ask him about design thinking. And this is what he said. He said, so unless we popularize design methods and design approaches, and we use the convenient term design thinking, even though I think it has lots of downsides to it, but anyhow. And I was like, you turd. Like, you think that, you think that the term has downsides, but not the methodology? But then I got curious, and I realized maybe 
he's right. The term does actually have a lot of downsides, right? As designers, we are told the moment that we enter our first design course to think of, to think of, to think of, right? This is what we're taught, told, but at the same time, we're actually being taught something completely different. Through mantras like usability, we're actually being taught to think for, as though we've become these Vitruvian godlike creatures, and simply by entering this profession, we become the arbiters of all that's good and just. And if there's one thing I've learned in all of it, it's this. Thinking is elitist. Think about it. No, don't think. Question. Who gets to be in a think tank? What gets to be a think tank? Who gets to be a thought leader? Who gets to do design thinking? And are they really doing the thinking, or are they just getting the credit? The world has taught us that a disabled body is nothing more than a body in need of intervention. And this is exactly what designers do. We design interventions. We dedicate our careers to it. We are here today because of our commitment to this process. We are seekers who develop our skills with rigor because we oftentimes want to be the best. There is a certain glory in being a designer, right? And so I see the natural progression. Of course, we're going to want to apply our highly attuned skills to something that we think needs fixing, but I'm someone who straddles both sides. I am a disabled designer, and while solutions are fulfilling to me as a designer, as a disabled person, this process feels destructive. It feels like we have become a project or a topic rather than a discipline or a craft. Where is the rigor? Design schools are beginning to offer accessibility curriculum, but in lieu of creativity, students are learning about disability through compliance checklists. But that's not design. Design is art, right? Well, art with rules. And if accessibility is the rules, where is the art? And this is where I come in, right? Because the art is in disability culture, disability history, disability knowledge, and disability theory. People don't realize that disability is something that a person can feel passion for and endeavor in. Disability can be a practice a creative practice, but design schools aren't fostering relationships with people who engage in disability as a creative practice. And so a culture is being created where students don't think they need to build real relationships with actual disabled people. They think they just need to feel empathy for us. So I have a little extra time here, so I'm gonna sort of spiel on this other thing that I've been really interested in and then kind of get back to my, my points. So um, last year I grew really frustrated with this sort of, um, series of disability products that were getting lauded in the press, but where the disability community was fighting really hard back at. Um, I remember one specifically, there was a, a wheelchair, it was a stair climbing wheelchair, and Mashable uh, praised it and said, can you believe what these students created? And then what you do is, is you go into like disability Twitter, and what you find is, is people mocking it. So I created this term called a disability dongle. And what a disability dongle is, is it's a well-intended and elegant yet useless solution to a problem we never knew we always had. There's a part two to the definition, which is that disability dongles are most frequently created in design schools in that IDEO, but I sometimes leave that one out. <laughs> um, but interestingly, if you actually went and read what disabled people were speaking about, right, they were, the stair climbing wheelchair, it may be glorious, right, but what happens is, is it comes at the expense of infrastructure. And so students think that they, come in, they can come in and build a product that is gonna inspire the likes of Mashable, and, and they stop thinking about ramps and basic access to stuff that disabled people need to get by. And so what happens is, is these products get made, but they're never actually affordable, and so they never get off the ground, nobody ever benefits, it is simply just a portfolio enhancer for that student or that brand. And so for me, and this is I think why I've, I've really kind of been so passionate about this and is, is because when are we gonna start investing in infrastructure? When are we gonna start to really loud maintenance, right? Because these are the things that disabled people really want. We don't want a wheelchair that stands up because if it was a wheelchair that stood up, it would be a wall, right? So if the, the um, bounce around. So interestingly, so I created the WIC Fellowship and um, uh, one of the top desi desi design schools in the United States reached out to me and um, they were like, we have a student that we're interested in for the fellowship, but also do you want to see our disability numbers? And I was like, sure. Um, 
and so they sent me the disability numbers. And there was something that I knew going into it. There's two things I knew. I knew, on average, about 11% of any college population is disabled, right? The other thing I knew, right, was how these numbers are acquired. And these aren't students that claim disability or identify as disabled. These are students that go through a stigmatizing process in order to get their most basic needs met, right? They first have to go to a doctor, get a doctor's note. They then take it to the school, the disability support services. They then have to go through testing. And then they actually ultimately have to hand deliver that note to their teacher who they don't actually realize was taught before the semester began that anything outside of the accommodations that were listed would make them a legal liability. So now the teacher is scared of the student. right? So that's how these numbers are acquired. And the thing that astounded me was that at this particular school, their disability numbers were about three times the national average. And then I realized it, they weren't a fluke, right? And so, you know, this is where I'm at. And I really, I'm, I'm really fighting hard to have an opportunity to research this because you have to figure out, like, why is it that, that these students are entering design uh, curriculum at such uh, high levels, right? Well, the first part I can sort of surmise based on my, all my previous work, right? Disabled people, we are the original life hackers. We spend our lives cultivating an intuitive creativity because we are forced to navigate a world that is not built for our bodies, right? So, of course, these students might want to harness that for their professional careers. The second thing we need to research is, is what is happening to these students year after year, you know? And I think that these are the students who aren't able to get their needs met, feel too stigmatized to request accommodations, and these are the students that are dropping out. And then the third question is, is what, what's happening to these students after they graduate? And to that I can only ask you, when's the last time you encountered a disabled creative director in your work, right? This is what we're up against. So for me, the question is, what if, instead of trying to smooth out disability, what if we instead develop the capacity to acknowledge and appreciate the friction of disability? I want to be able to honor the friction of my disability. I like to think if design can start investing in disabled people instead of trying to fix us, this work can be expansive. We are designers. As children, we may discover we have a knack for design, and yet we know that's not enough. We go to school, we develop our skills, we graduate, and we attend events like this one here today. This is our commitment to our profession, and yet, when it comes to disability, we oftentimes think we just know, but we don't, right? This is a process that requires commitment and reflection. I'm gonna leave you with this story. So, uh, a year and a half ago, I was walking through New York City, I was, um, about a block and a half south of work, it was really early, 7 a.m., and I encountered the most beautiful bouquet of flowers I had ever seen in my entire life, just thrown away in a trash can. I, I couldn't believe it. So the first thing I did was I took a picture, and then the second thing I started thinking is, is somebody needs to save these flowers. And the, the cherry blossoms were over six feet tall. They were too big, but I saw that there were some tulips scattered around the bottom. And so I picked them up, and I took them into the office. And I open up the picture and I'm looking at it and I think to myself, somebody has to save the cherry blossoms. And so I go back, right, and I'm looking at this trash can and I find two cherry blossoms and I, I tug at them. And in the process of pulling them out, I knocked the whole trash can over. And I was thinking to myself, but it was so beautiful, what have I done, right? And so, and I was wearing a, a brand new leather jacket and I didn't care, I, I hugged that New York City trash can and I lifted it back up. But even then, it was lopsided, and I was just, I was horrified. And so I, I went back to the office, and I'm looking at the picture again, and I noticed, I noticed on the ground there's a hashtag. So I search on Instagram, I look it up, and it was only then that I realized that nobody had thrown these flowers away. This, it was a public art installation. <laughs> I was just, I was so horrified. I just, I started crying, and I, I did the only thing I knew how to do. I emailed Lewis Miller, the artist, and this is what I said to him. I said, I find myself completely overwhelmed, both by the beauty and by the misguided nature of my instinct. I hope this serves as a reminder to me, a disability advocate, that not all things need saving. Sometimes they just need to exist. Thank you. <laughs>